Good morning and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Sharper Iron is underwritten by the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. On this Monday, November 30th, we're starting a new series here on Sharper Iron. It's called Advent with the Prophets. Starting today and going all the way until just before Christmas, we will be looking at a variety of Old Testament readings appointed for the season of Advent. As we spend this time with the saints who waited patiently in the day before Christ's coming in the flesh, we will be prepared to receive him now in word and sacrament, even as we too wait for him to come again in glory. The text that we'll be looking at today to kick off the series is Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 through 19. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's word today, we have with us returning guest, Pastor Mark Bars. Pastor Bars serves at Crown of Life Lutheran Church in San Antonio, Texas. Pastor Bars, welcome back to Sharp Iron. Good morning, Pastor Apple. So good to be with you today. So we're talking about Advent, Advent with the prophets. Just help us get started with talking about Advent. What is this season of the church year that we've entered into? Well, yesterday was the first Sunday of Advent, and that's maybe just a little bit of a preposition there. I prefer to say of Advent and then the Sundays in Lent, the Sundays in Lent that are moving us toward our Lord's passion, death, and resurrection. But of Advent, we are completely immersed in this time of preparation, of anticipation. It is a penitential season, so some of our worship practices are a little more subdued. We don't sing the Gloria and Excelsis until we come to the festival of our Lord's, of our Lord's incarnation. But here we are. It's, it, is, it is Advent, and it's, it's Advent that a church year closed with the prayer, Come Lord Jesus, and a church year begins with the prayer, Come Lord Jesus, in his in his first appearing. So how good it is to be looking at scriptures together, not only today, but in the coming weeks that are, that are focused on those promises made that will become, that will become promises kept. The season of Advent and today is actually the day of St. Andrew, one of Jesus' disciples and apostles. So there's, it's really hard to figure out exactly why certain things happen in the life of the church, but the Advent season always begins on the Sunday closest to November 30th, and today is the day of St. Andrew. And yet, yet so very appropriate, because Andrew, if we recall a little bit of his story, in John chapter 1, he is the one who speaks to Peter and says, come with me, we have found the Messiah, we, we, this, we think this is the one, this is the one who that has been promised to us and now is revealed to us. And then later on in the Gospel of John, there's that, that wonderful story when some Greeks say, we wish to see Jesus. We want to see this Jesus. These proselytes want to know more about the one who is the incarnate Savior. And Andrew is the one as a foreign missionary, as it were, who brings them, who brings them to talk with our Lord. So the day of St. Andrew today, and, and it's a, it's a good way for us to begin our conversation and these studies on sharper iron for the next few weeks. So as you pointed out, the themes that we experienced at the end of the previous church year, there's going to be a lot of overlap. Sometimes as we go through from the last Sunday in the church year to the first Sunday in Advent, there's maybe you're wondering, well, what changed? <laughs> we're, we're still waiting for Christ's coming. And I think that might be something just to talk about briefly Advent isn't just, let's get ready to celebrate Christmas. It's, it's more than that. The word Advent does mean coming. And so we are thinking of Christ's coming the first time when he came in the flesh, born as a baby in Bethlehem. But it's more than that, right? There, there's, it's not just, hey, let's get ready to celebrate Christmas again. It, it's a bigger preparation. Can you talk, take us into that a bit? Well, we sometimes speak of Yes, his, his first coming, his first appearing, uh, 
conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, will, will rush with the shepherds into Bethlehem to see this thing that has come to pass. And, and we do so as God's people, even 2,000 years later, in light of his ongoing coming, his presence in the church, his gifts to us, his proclamation, the way in which his word still brings him to us, and, and he appears to us now in his written and revealed word, not wrapped in swaddling clothes and, and laid in a manger. And he comes to us as, as he splashes us with water in baptism, and, and we are baptized into his death and resurrection. We die with him, we rise with him, we live with him. And all that in light of his final appearing, his, his coming at the end of time in glory for the, for the, great, the great return and the great resurrection, including the great reunion of souls and bodies. You know that part of my own story is that just recently my 89-year-old mother died, and her funeral up in Kansas was an opportunity for us to affirm the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Her soul is now with our Lord, knows only joy and only peace, but her body rests in a cemetery near Cheney, Kansas, and it will be raised on our door on our Lord's final appearing at that great at that great resurrection. So we pray, come, Lord Jesus. The the other way that is I think always helpful to consider the church here is is it's not a straight line. It, it's always a circle. It 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 moves us through, and it and we hear the story again, and we experience again. Uh, our Lord's birth, his epiphany, his baptism, his, his temptations, his journey into Jerusalem, his parables, his miracles, his, his suffering, his death, his resurrection, his, his ascension, and his gifts to his church. And, and the church will repeat that. And, and it's good for us to know, too, as Lutheran Christians, that this isn't just our story. This isn't just the way we worship, that most of the Christian church around the world observes a church year with these different seasons and, and movements. Some of our brothers and sisters in Christ maybe aren't, aren't quite in tune with that, although I hear more and more that they, that they are, that they have come to appreciate uh, different groups and denominations are coming more to appreciate. But Advent, it's, it's Advent, and it is a glorious time. I will add one little thing. I am, I am grateful and not everybody sees it maybe the same way, but I'm old enough to remember that Advent was purple, but it was the same pyramids that were there in Lent. And and as a younger child, I thought, but but we're getting ready for Christmas, not for Good Friday and Easter. And and I do appreciate visually that that blue calls us on this on this different journey with with yes, some different a different destination, but but a different kind of journey as we wait for the promise of the Savior to be kept. Mm, yeah, the, we use blue here in Smithville as well for Advent, but I, I'm familiar with the using the purple. That was the way – I'm not quite as old, but I grew up with purple too. And and the, the connection is is quite telling. Even when you – and I know we're doing the Old Testament reading for, for Advent, but when you get to the Advent, the first Sunday in Advent and the Gospel reading is Palm Sunday – and and all of a sudden, oh, Jesus is going into Jerusalem. Hold on, I thought we we're getting ready for Christmas. Well, we are, but but why does Jesus come at Christmas? And so that connection between Advent and Lent, oh, we could we could spend a lot of time talking about that too. But but just to help us keep going. So one of the one of the features of this series is that we're looking at Old Testament texts, and they will come from a variety of places. It's a bit different than what we've been doing on Sharp Iron, going through one whole book of the Bible at a time. And these Old Testament readings come from the lectionary or the lectionaries. There are, there are multiple ones that we use as a part of, of our church body. So there's there's a one-year lectionary, there's a three-year lectionary. Each of these texts are going to be coming from different Sundays from different times. Just give us a bit of a, an overview an introduction to what that's about. Well, it seems to be from, from church history that very early on, perhaps in some recordings as early as the fourth century, there were a series of readings that were, that were used within the life of the church. Uh, the phrase that sometimes is used, and I, I don't necessarily teach it here completely, but you say it to people sometimes, it's called Lectio Continua, and it means a continuous reading of a lection, of a, 
a continuous reading throughout one book of scripture. And we have that still happening mostly with our gospel readings uh, and with certain epistles, although for briefer times. Now, during the Advent season, it's, it's a little bit more of this and then that and then this and then that thematically. But we are very met. Very many of our hearers would be used to hearing the same readings that that I hear, that you hear, that you read at Grace and Smithville, at Crown of Life in San Antonio, at St. Paul's up in in Cheney, Kansas, wherever wherever it might be. I, I read a I read a comment years ago from a a non Lutheran a lay person who said she'd like to go into the grocery store on Sunday or on Monday mornings and ask the checkout did. Did you hear about the paralyzed man yesterday? And the checkout might go, what are you talking about? Or the <laughs> checkout might say, yes, I did. And, and so we are connected. The, the visible body of Christ can be connected. And, and within our own church body, you know, some will use, and I think perhaps more than will use, a three, one of the three years. So we've begun Series B. Our primary gospel is the Gospel of Mark this year. And, and yet... Others will be using a one-year lectionary, so the readings will repeat, the same readings will repeat the next year to the next year to the next year. There's value in that, in hearing those same readings uh, every year. And, and I appreciate the, the breadth of, of being able to read and preach on and teach from God's word with, with a larger amount of reading. So the ones you've chosen for Advent are all the Old Testament readings. And this one today for the beginning of Advent takes us to farthest back in the Old Testament. Now, as you've explained, and I'll let you say that to our, to our listeners, this, this isn't one that we're going to hear right away, but in the chronology of the Old Testament, it occurs first. Right. So this reading, Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 through 19, is actually the Old Testament reading for the fourth Sunday in Advent in the one-year lectionary, that series of readings that repeats year after year after year. And as, as you mentioned, I chose to move it forward because it does come first canonically. As we go through this series, we're going to hear a lot from Isaiah. We're going to hear from Jeremiah. We're going to pick up some Malachi, some Micah, some Second Samuel as well, and maybe one or two that I've missed. But Deuteronomy, which again comes Advent 4, is the first one canonically. And as I was going through the various lectionaries and picking out the readings, Deuteronomy 18, I recognized it, but it, it struck me a bit unusual because I associate it with a different event in the church here, which we might be able to talk about as a part of our study. I put it forward because it's the first one, scripturally speaking, if you're just going to page through the Bible, you're going to get into Deuteronomy first. So that's going to introduce our study with Advent in the Prophets, Deuteronomy 18. Let's talk a little bit of context in in the book of Deuteronomy, where do we find ourselves in the scriptural narrative when we're in the book of Deuteronomy? Well, Deuteronomy is the fifth book of scripture. It closes the Torah, the, the Jewish perspective, the Torah, technically, they could translate it the law, but the teachings, the instruction, it's the books of Moses. And Jesus will use that reference quite often what did Moses say? Or you have heard that Moses said, and using that as shorthand to speak of one of these five books, the, the book of Deuteronomy is an echo of Exodus. However, there's, a, there's this approximate 40-year division from the narrative events of Exodus to the recalling, the remembering events of Deuteronomy. They are poised to finally enter the promised land. Joshua will soon be appointed as commander in chief. Uh, the Levites will be the priestly tribe. They will carry the Ark of the Covenant to the, to the Jordan River and step into the Jordan and God will dam it up and, and allow them to walk through into the promised land. But God uses Moses for this time of review of remembrance and say, this is what happened and this is what it means. Part of it also has to be that those who were younger when they came out of Egypt 
are, are now the older ones and the leader ones. They need to hear, they need to remember. Perhaps some of them were even quite young children gathered around Mount Sinai. And, and so Moses is used by God to tell the story and not to completely use every point of Exodus. There are some significant things that that maybe I'm not saying they're left out, but he doesn't he doesn't review those in the same way. He retells the ten covenant words in chapter five. In, in chapter seven, there's this wonderful phrase, and we actually heard this in the uh, in the series of readings back in July. It was the last Sunday of July. You are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for His treasured possession out of all the people who are on the face of the earth. And that, I think that verse, uh, chapter seven, verse six, verse six, really sets us up for what we're talking about today. It's who are you and, and who is this God who has, who has chosen you and how will you follow him? How will he speak to you? If Moses is gone, what next? And, and so here we are ready to know that there will be God will raise up a prophet again. There will be a prophet like me, but a prophet who will be greater. And that's, that's the one we're, we're going to finally hear and ultimately hear and know that he speaks, he speaks the truth of God to us. There, there are tons of great texts in the book of Deuteronomy. Sometimes uh, maybe Deuteronomy gets lumped in with Leviticus as one of those books that we think is it's kind of boring to read or numbers. And it's like, oh, we, we, we get bogged down sometimes when we're trying to read through the Bible. But there's tons of great texts in Deuteronomy. And it, it you might even think of it as Moses' farewell sermon. And he really is quite the excellent preacher. And you see that throughout that text from Deuteronomy 7 is a fantastic one. The the whole reading there is just amazing as, as the Lord continues from the verse that you read, you know, he tells them, look, I don't love, I don't love you <laughs> because you're so many. Basically, he just says, I love you because I love you. <laughs> That's who he is. I mean, the, you see the steadfast love of God come through in this book over and over again. Jesus quotes from it more than once in his own ministry, perhaps most notably when he's tempted by Satan in the wilderness. Every time that Satan comes at Jesus, with the temptation, Jesus quotes back to him from the book of Deuteronomy. And so this is a key book, scripturally speaking, one that we do well to, to learn and read from. The text from Deuteronomy 18, I think you, you framed it well, that Moses is going to die soon. He's going to leave. And so what now? Who, who do the people of Israel listen to, to hear the word of God? Because so far they've been listening to Moses. And, and this is a, a text that encourages them as to who they should listen to. Any more introductory comments before we look at the text? Let's, let's open right. the text. Let's All read right. the text. Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 through 19. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen, just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, or see this great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, They are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. That is the text we've got for today, Deuteronomy 18, 15 through 19. For the sake of completeness, I'm going to read the next three verses because there is a little bit there about, well, what if someone comes along speaking a different word? What then? So just a few more verses from Deuteronomy 18, just to help us round out this context. Verses 20 through 22 now. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how may we know the word that the Lord has not, how may we know the word that the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, this is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. So just a little bit more there about how to discern who is the true prophet and the false prophet from the Lord. So our text begins at Deuteronomy 18, 15. 
the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you. We'll start there. I mean, I think we could spend a lot of time just on this verse. It stands out to me, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet. So the when the Lord, when a prophet comes, it is the Lord who sends him. I'll let you take it from there. I hope that many of our hearers, and, and I suspect that a number of them do, are familiar with the Lutheran Study Bible. And, and I'll tell you why I, I appreciate it more and more. Because as I'm reading, as I'm studying, and I turn another page, and there is one of these excellent summary pages. And uh, I, know our, I know our hearers uh, are only hearers. They're not, they're not looking on. But I'm going to just show you what I have right here. As I, as I photocopied four pages, and, and they include this. Uh, the pattern of the prophets, false prophets then and now. Both of those are in Deuteronomy, pages in Deuteronomy. And then in Jeremiah, prophetic perspective and prophecies about the coming Messiah. And because it was three pages long, there's even an even better one before the book of Isaiah, before the major prophets and the minor prophets. It's pages 1081 to 1083, and it's titled All the Prophets. I think it should be titled All About All the Prophets. It, it's wonderfully helpful. And to read just one section here and, and read about prophets, and we know the word, or we think we know the word, just to spend a little time poking around, finding these other ones, pausing in our, in our, in our reading of God's word, in our considering of God's word. These, these can be, these can be very helpful. It's, I know, you know, this isn't an advertisement. CPH isn't going to give us royalties because they sold a few more Lutheran study Bibles. But, but there's some delightful, some delightful and helpful resources. The, the other thing that, that's really important is to consider what a prophet is and does. So many times, and, and it's not wrong, but I think it can be somewhat uh, misdirected, is we think a prophet, and God uses prophets to predict the future, and to, to tell the future, future events. Well, sometimes this is true. Sometimes this is most certainly true. And, and there are wonderful ways, uh, hundreds of times throughout the Old Testament scriptures, that, that we see pointing to everything from Bethlehem Ephrathah in Micah chapter 5, that it names the town that the Messiah will be born in, to Isaiah 53, to uh, the one who, who, is, who is despised and rejected, and all of those things that when we read the Gospels of our Lord's, of our Lord's passion and, and the way he is mocked, it's You'd, you'd think Isaiah was alive when this was happening. No, it was, it was hundreds of years before. So what does a prophet do? What is a prophet? A prophet is one, uh, the, the, word, the word prophet or the word to prophesy is, is the word nabi, and it, and it can be translated to pour forth mm. to, in speech from God. And, and that is obviously so critical. And that's why when you read that second section of, the, of this portion of Deuteronomy 18, when someone who doesn't speak for God, and it, and it doesn't happen if it's not true, but the prophet does speak out from God. The phrase declares the Lord is in the Old Testament scriptures 340 times, and, and yet the prophets are the mouthpiece, but the Lord is the one who's declaring. That's what he's doing. That's how he uses the prophets. He speaks out God's word. Sometimes it's warning. It's admonition. But very often, and, and there is gospel throughout scripture from Genesis to Revelation. It is comfort. It is hope. It is promise. Yeah, this is an important thing to keep in mind. I'm glad you brought it up because the word prophet does often in our minds make us think of speaking about the future. And like you said, that does happen. It, it certainly happens. But you might even just translate a prophet as preacher, one who hears the word of God and preaches. I, I teach this in youth confirmation and in, in an adult confirmation as well. When we talk about the offices that Christ bears, we talk about him as prophet and priest and king. And I, I like to draw a picture on the board where you've got, you know, usually, you know, God is at the top and the hearers are in the bottom 
And then in between them stands the prophet. And the prophet is the one who hears the word from God and then speaks that word to the people. Whatever that word may be, if the word is about something that will happen in the future, if it's a promise that will be kept, then he is speaking about the future. But so often, the prophets do speak about what is happening at the moment, or perhaps what has happened in the past. You, you get a bit of all of that in the text that we've got from Deuteronomy 18 today, where Moses reminds the people of, hey, this is what happened on Mount Sinai. Here's how it's going to apply to you now and in the future. We see it throughout the prophets, that they are the ones who speak the word of God faithfully, the one whom the Lord has sent to his people to deliver his word. And I think we're going to go ahead and take our break there before we pick up a different topic. You're listening to Sharp Iron here on KFUO. We'll be right back. Please stick around. Since 1978, Lutheran Church Extension Fund has had the humble privilege of supporting Lutheran Church Missouri Synod Ministries and her workers. Thanks to faithful investors, LCEF has provided thousands of church workers, congregations, schools, and organizations with the low-cost loans and resources they need to reach more people with the saving name of Christ. To learn more, visit lcef.org or call 800-843-5233, 800-843-5233. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Monday, November 30th. We're looking at Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 through 19. We've got Pastor Mark Bars with us. He serves at Crown of Life Lutheran Church in San Antonio, Texas. Pastor Bars, prior to the break, we were talking about the work of a prophet. I was comparing the prophet to a preacher, one who hears God's word and speaks it to the people, but I didn't give, didn't let you have time to respond. So go ahead. Well, as some of our hearers would recall from our previous conversations, our studies together, you were part of my congregation. You and your family were part of my congregation for a number of years. But this was before the Apple family came into, came into San Antonio. And, and I was trying to make the point one Sunday morning about preaching out and, and only speaking God's word. And if the pastor up front, if he starts saying what he tells you is the truth, but it's not the truth of God's word, you need to be very cautious about that. And what I had done was I had queued two members, one in the 8 o'clock service and one in the 1045 service, to interrupt my sermon because that's the way I was talking as though, well, this is the way it is, and I'm telling you the way it is. And first was Don, and Don is kind of a soft-spoken guy. You might know the Don of, I'm speaking to. And he stood up and he said, well, wait a minute, Pastor Bars. That's, that's, now are you telling us what you think the truth is? Or are you telling us, are you supposed to be telling us what God's word is the truth? And I said, thank you. Thank you for that correction. Thank you so much. You did, thank you. And people were, you know, a little bit, well, I'm glad he was bold to do that. In the 1045 service, the gentleman's name was Paul. He was an army officer, and he was a little more assertive. And, and he jumped right to his feet, and again, he interrupted my sermon and said, Pastor Bars, that's, that's not what preaching is supposed to be. You're supposed to be presenting God's word to us. And I said, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for getting me, getting me back on track. And then, and then he said, and another, kid, and another thing, <laughs> that, that wasn't in his script. So, so he, he did the right thing at first. Anyway, um, I, need to, I tell people that. You, you say when you teach youth confirmation, when you teach adult confirmands, you, remind, you see what the role of the pastor as prophetic to, to speak out God's word. And, and I do tell people that that is your job to to listen carefully, that's your the vocation of the hearer, but 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 to caution us that that we are doing what what God has has given to us, this this role of of preacher, of prophetic preaching, not predicting the future, right. but speaking out, speaking forth, speaking forth God's word. Now, back to the scripture narrative, not only the before us, but here we are in Advent. And during Advent, we hear John the Baptizer. We hear the last, as he's sometimes called, the last Old Testament prophet, 
the one who who is that bridge of 400 years from Malachi to the time of Christ and who speaks out who calls people who calls people to repentance who who finally and wonderfully in those words that we echo in our liturgy so often behold the lamb of god who takes away the sin of the world uh, i i like to say that that uh, john the john the baptizer was a lutheran uh, he didn't know it but because he pointed to christ alone so so he he wanted people to see and that's what the prophets ultimately do. That's what that's what Christian pastors do. Is 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 they point to Christ. Deuteronomy chapter eighteen: The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me. You said this is Moses' farewell sermon. He's he's soon to die. God will bury him, and the Israelites will soon after that cross the Jordan into the promised land. A prophet like me. Listen, you will listen to him, but it is like me from among you. Now, now, that's just simple language, but there's depth to it. And, and we should certainly be able to see this as a, oh, not so subtle, but not so subtle, that the one who is the final ultimate prophet like me will have human flesh. He will be he will be born into human life. Yes, yes, by the power of the Holy Spirit, the divine son humbles himself and, and takes the form of a servant. But and he will be he will be among you from your brothers. Uh, the different English translations from your brothers are are interesting here. I checked several of them. The uh, New American Standard Bible says from your countrymen. And the New International Version and the uh, Good News translation say your fellow Israelite. So it will be from, from God's people. It will be a son of Abraham, as, as a Jew might refer to himself as. And, and one of the reasons why this is, this is interesting and challenging is as, as you and I might be surprised by the opportunity to witness to people we never expected. And, and I am having that ongoing opportunity from God to witness to a Muslim is a Muslim looks at this verse and says, this prophet is Muhammad. Hmm. That's, that's their reading of this. And we say, Oh, it's better than that. Yeah. It's, it's, it's wow. bigger than that. It's, it's more than that. Um, and, and the other thing about this opening, I mean, this is just, we read this, and, and I don't say we read it and take it, take it lightly, but, but how this happens in sequence. You read some that follows the appointed reading for Advent 4, for, for uh, four weeks from now, but there's a little bit before that, and it's, it's a strong caution about what the Israelites will face as they enter the land of Canaan. And, and I'm going to, I have my Bible open to, to read a little bit of this for our listeners. And he says, do not follow the abominable practices of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughter as an offering, anyone who practices divination or tells fortunes or interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or a charmer, or a medium, or a necromancer, or one who inquires of the dead. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. And, and he's really telling his people, don't just, don't do those things, but don't listen to those things, those who, who are doing, those who are saying, well, I can talk to the spirits of the dead, whatever it, whatever it might be. So when we start with verse 15, Although the the English text doesn't do this, there there really is a but there. Hmm. But this not these people, not these kinds of uh, prophets, these false prophets. But the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me hmm. from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen, as as the Father says at the Mount of Transfiguration, my son. Listen, listen to him. Listen to this one. I mean, there's there's a way from mountaintop. Yes, we've got mountaintop Sinai Horeb here, but another mountaintop that's going to point us, as John does, 
would point us to Christ and we listen to him. Hmm. I mean, all, all along here, you've been pointing out how this text does point us to Christ, and rightly so. He is the fulfillment. He is the prophet like mm-hmm. Moses, the prophet that's greater than Moses. Think of the prologue to John's gospel. Law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And yet, at the same time, all along in the Old Testament, you can see how the Lord does continue to raise up faithful prophets, beginning with Moses. You, you mentioned Joshua, who comes next in the line of the leaders of God's people, who we may not always think of as a prophet in the traditional sense. And yet you could classify him as a prophet, and you see connections to Moses' own ministry. So, for example, Joshua is led into the promised land through a parted body of water, the Jordan River. Or Joshua takes off his sandals before the commander of the Lord's army. Connections to Moses. And you could do this with just about any of the prophets where you see how he is a prophet like Moses. Isaiah comes to mind just as one who we'll be hearing from in in coming days, the one who experienced the fire in the temple of the Lord as Moses once spoke to the Lord in the the burning bush. So you you see this, but but Jesus comes as the one who is greater than Moses, the, the final prophet in this line, one who is is like him, not only in that fleshly descent, but just in the fact that he has flesh, uh, pointing to his incarnation, as you said, and and even better than any other false prophet you might imagine. I did not, I was not aware that Islam took this verse in that way. I'm not terribly surprised having learned that, but what a joy it is for us as Christians to be able to point, no, there's there's someone even better, someone who is is true, someone who actually does have the word of God in his mouth, who in fact is the word of God made flesh for us. And, and to use that, hopefully, to transition back into the text then, it is the word that God wants to give to his people. But, but as you're reading in this text, Moses takes the people back to Horeb, to Mount Sinai, where they were afraid of hearing the word of God. They, they knew or they thought that if they heard the word of God directly from him, they were going to die. And the Lord even says, yeah, you're right. I'm going to do something about that. So, so take us into that. Why, why is it that the people are afraid of hearing the word directly from God? Why does God need to provide this mediator in the prophet? So the Lord your God at Horeb, Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb, same place, different names. That happens in different other times in scripture as well. On the day of the assembly, they've come out of Egypt through the sea They've been led into the wilderness. They've been fed with the, with the manna, with the what is it bread and the quail and water from the rock. And they come to Sinai and, and God says, this is where I'm going to meet you. I'm going to meet you on this, on this mountain. Moses gets to go up and comes up and down the mountain. And at sometimes some of us get to go up the mountain too. And, and that's part of Exodus. But they gather around the mountain, and it says in chapter 19, now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. There was, there was lightning, there was thunder, there was a loud trumpet blast, but the, the fire and, and the smoke around the mountain. And don't approach the mountain. Don't touch it. Don't even let your animals touch it. Or they're going, or they're going to die. And then after the uh, the telling of the covenant words, I, I prefer to say the ten covenant words rather than the ten commandments. Sometimes people just think it's a list of do this, don't do that. It's really God initiating this covenant. They say they say to Moses, "You speak to us, and we will listen. But do not let God speak to us, lest we die." Now, once more, this is 40 years later. This is Moses reminding, reviewing, having the people remember what happened. But some were quite young and had come out of Egypt as, as infants and young children. And now they're the, they're the adults. They're well, well grown. They need to hear the story. They need to remember. And, and yet that God does speak. He mediates his speech. He he allows then Moses, Moses who has to put the veil on because his face is shining because he's been in the presence of Yahweh, but, but he will speak in a mediated manner. Now, there's, there's a couple of directions for this for us still today. God still speaks in a mediated manner. He still speaks through 
through servants, through some men that he has given that privilege to. He speaks through his, his written word, his proclaimed word, his read word, his sung word. He, he acts and he, he works through simple water combined with his strong word, with bread and wine, ordinary means, stuff that, that he gives his word to, he puts his word with, connects it to his word, and serves us with, with washing that is a renewal in the Holy Spirit and that baptism that saves us, and he feeds us with his own body and blood at his, at his supper. So he still does mediate, and, and yet it is not Moses in place of God. It is, it is God still serving his church. He's still giving his gifts to his people. Right, and, and all of that centered in Christ again. I, as you were talking, I was reminded of uh, the way the writer to the Hebrews opens his epistle. In, in many and various ways, God spoke to his people old by the prophets, but now in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. So that, that all of those means by which God brings his word to us right now, that is that is Jesus still coming to us. I, I mentioned again earlier, you know, the threefold office of Christ, prophet, priest, and king. And, and well, is, is Christ a, a prophet? Well, yes, he speaks the word of God. He is the word of God. Is he still a prophet? Well, the answer is yes, he's still doing that in his church. Such that whenever his word is is read and heard and preached, that is him doing that work still. Uh, that is how God addresses us now, is always in his son, Jesus Christ. I mean, and, that, and that's that's such a an important Advent thing to keep in mind. As who are we waiting for? We're waiting for the one who comes to bring the word of God, to be the word of God for us. So, go, well... I mean, and if you feel free to respond to that, but in verse 18, then just so that, I mean, so we've got this mediator in place. God puts the prophet there to speak the word in a way that his people can hear it and not die, lest they come into his unmediated presence and be struck dead as the sinners they are. So he gives the word to the prophet, but that doesn't take away from the seriousness of it. The people are not allowed to say, oh, that's just Moses. That's his opinion. Well, when he's not speaking his opinion, when he is speaking the word of God faithfully, you dare not ignore the prophet, because if you do, you're actually ignoring the one who sent the prophet, and you're going to be responsible, again, not to the prophet, but to the one who sent him, who is the Lord. He will put, uh, Moses says to the Israelites, I will put my words, the Lord has said this, Moses is speaking it, I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak the, them all that I command him. I hear our Lord's great commission finally here, don't we? Mm -hmm. From Matthew 28 and that mm -hmm. baptize in the name of the father and of the, and the son and the Holy spirit and teach them to observe all that I have, all that I have commanded you. But, but there's also something about my words in his mouth as, as Isaiah in chapter six says, I'm a man of unclean lips mm -hmm. and these are people of unclean lips and the Lord touches his mouth and says, now speak. And, and Jeremiah, when we hear Jeremiah's call, the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. Now, what do we say, well, isn't that wonderful for Isaiah, for Jeremiah? And, and yet it still happens. It, it's not as dramatic. It's not as dramatic, but when God, through his church, when the Lord of the church places those within congregations to, to be his mouthpiece, to know that their mouths are touched and made, and made clean, and, and to be able to, uh, to be given the privilege and the responsibility to speak out God's word, his word of life, of forgiveness, of salvation, of redemption, of reconciliation, of rescue, what a what a privilege and for God's people to hear it as the word of the Lord that it is it is his word that is being shared and proclaimed and given into their hearts and the spirit of God uh, increases and deepens faith and trust and confidence and joy in Christ yeah, in the, it's, I believe it's in the rite of individual confession and absolution. After the confession, the the pastor speaks, and I, not this isn't going to be a perfect quote, but do you believe that my forgiveness is not mine, but it is God's forgiveness? And the answer is yes. 
that when we hear the called and ordained servant of Christ sent by him speaking the absolution, we should not hear the voice of Mark Bars or the voice of Tim Apple. We should hear the voice of Christ making use of another man's lips. When, when he preaches the word of God faithfully, when he's reading the scriptures, we, we should be hearing the voice of Christ to us, which is a fantastic gift to us as the church. It is a fantastic privilege to be in that office and a rather sobering responsibility to bear is as you were mentioning earlier in the the sermon that you preach where you had people interrupt you or as we consider you know how Moses concludes this when we go past the text we've got for today I mean we think about the the second commandment and not taking the Lord's name in vain or not misusing the name of the Lord this matter of false preaching is is really one of the key sins against that commandment that a, a preacher would be found unfaithful to speak the word not of God, but the word of man and present it as the word of God is, is harmful to himself and also to his hearers. It is, it is a rather sobering responsibility. And, and by God's grace, he, he keeps faithful men for himself, even in the midst of their sins, such that his word does get proclaimed faithfully, which is a, a marvelous miracle that, that God would use men like us to do such a wonderful task. I'm not going to put you on the spot, Pastor Apple, by asking if you remember anything your pastor ever said to you when you were at Crown of Life. But when I was, I'm guessing, 11 years old or so, my pastor said, there is one time I do not want to see people yawning in the congregation. And he wasn't talking about during his sermon. He was talking about when he said, in the name of the Father and of the Son, I, a called and ordained servant of Christ, And by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And my pastor was my dad. And and he he was he was um, he made an excellent point. And and I I've told him that I've told him that since. In fact, I just hinted at it one time. And he said he said and I said it wasn't during my sermon. It was when I spoke absolution. So. He remembered saying it, and I remembered that he. And I remember that he said it. I, I want to. I want to go on here a little bit more with with this um, speaking in speaking in my name to speak in the name of Christ to to speak in Yahweh's name. Moses said there will be other prophets that will follow, but there will finally be a prophet who is like Moses. He is. He is of the flesh. He is in the line of Abraham as Jesus is born into a Jewish family. And yet he is unlike Moses. Now, the the feeding of the 5,000 is the only miracle that is in all four Gospels. Now, some people know that. Some people go, I never thought about that. But it is. It's the only only miracle that's in all four Gospels. And, And what happens as John records this miracle, is that the people respond, this is John 6, verse 14, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Okay, that's good. But then they try to make him king by force because they they go, well, this guy's going to take care of our, he's going to feed fill our stomachs every day. We love this, we love this kind of a king. But they call him the prophet who was to come into the world. And he is, but he isn't. So you mentioned John 1 also. Uh, We're going to hear those words on Christmas morning. We're just beginning Advent. This is our our first Bible study in Advent. Yesterday was our first Sunday of Advent. But we're going to hear on Christmas Day, uh, always Christmas Eve is is the narrative. It's the shepherds and the angels and the, the Bethlehem and no room in the inn. But John 1 is always the Christmas Day gospel. It tells us what this means, that the word became flesh and came to dwell among us. For the law was given through Moses. This is the longer reading of John 1. Sometimes we stop at verse 14, but if we go on to verse 18, the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth through Jesus Christ. The prophets are, as in some sense, as Moses talks about, Prophet, a prophet like me, but the prophets, the role of prophet, they are theophanies. That's, that's a big word. It means God appearing, God showing himself. 
God appeared in the burning bush to Moses. He appeared with, with cloud by day and fire by night as he led his people, as he led his people through the, through the wilderness. His glory came into the, into the dedication of the temple under Solomon. But they are verbal theophanies. They are God showing himself, being present with his people, speaking out his truth, speaking his word. But Jesus Christ is the ultimate, the one that John will say later on in his letter that we actually touched him, we saw him, we heard him, we touched him, as they did, as they did especially on, on Easter night and, and saw the wounds in his, in his hands and in his side. Jesus becomes the ultimate theophany. God speaks to us, God appears to us, God stretches out his arms for us on the cross and they're pierced with they're pierced with nails and he suffers and he dies and he declares it is finished the the prophet his 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 final words there at on the cross it is it is finished the price is paid in full yeah i mean when to to go even farther than what what this is saying you know when you listen to the prophet here in Deuteronomy 18 you're listening to god that's true of jesus and even to the point that he'll say to Philip in John 14, when you've seen me, Philip, you've seen the Father. So, I mean, it's not only when you listen to Jesus, you've listened to God, but when you see Jesus, you've seen God. And particularly, as you said, when you see him die for you on the cross and then risen from the dead and and you actually get to to touch him, which we still today receive the body and blood into our hands. uh, It's just, it's a fantastic way of, of seeing how how Jesus is the fulfillment of this text so much better than any other prophet, whether the Old Testament or a, a prophet from another religion. Jesus is the fulfillment of this, the one to whom we shall listen, who is the word of God for us, who who brings us salvation. Pastor Bars, we've got three minutes left here on the morning for, for final thoughts on this text, the season of Advent, and, and how it all points us to this Savior, this final prophet who is the word of God for us, Jesus Christ. Moses tells the people and reminds them of what happened at Horeb at, Al- at Sinai, about a mountain that, that was a place of fear and of awe. He reminds them of what they saw and what they couldn't see. Moses himself, we recall in, in Exodus, he wanted, first he hid his face at the burning bush in chapter three, and then he wanted to see God's glory in chapter 33. and. And God said, Moses, you don't really want to see me because you're going to die if you see my face. But we do see the very face of God. It it, it is a face that Mary and Joseph saw for the first time as, as the Christ child is born, as the promise is kept, the seed of the woman, that Genesis 3 garden promise is kept. And, and we see him. Yes, we see him in the written and revealed word. We see him. And we come to a mountain though our god is a consuming fire hebrews chapter hebrews chapter 12 at golgotha the fire of sin was snuffed out the the fire that we deserved the torment the punishment of our sins our lord jesus christ the one who knew no sin who was made sin for us gives himself and the price is paid in full. And that mountain, that mountain called Golgotha, called Calvary, becomes a mountain that we return to time and time and again, Sunday after Sunday, as, as God's word of forgiveness is spoken to us. And we rejoice in being the treasured possession, the very, the very saints of God. Pastor Mark Bars is the pastor at Crown of Life Lutheran Church in San Antonio, Texas, helping us this morning with Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 through 19. Pastor Bars, thanks for being our guest this morning. You are very welcome. Great to be with you again. One like Moses, yet one better than Moses, Jesus Christ, the word of God made flesh to save you and me by his death and resurrection. He now reigns and he will come again. It is for his advent we greatly hope and anticipate god be with you as you do so during this advent season i look forward to journeying with you through the prophets i'm your host here on sharper iron pastor timothy apple of grace lutheran church in smithville texas thanks for spending the morning with us talk to you again tomorrow